what happens December 5th as you and others are opening, your troops are opening up mail and other stuff, right? Right, okay, so this is fascinating. So we're in three days of firefights, three continuous days of firefights. Nothing but firefights for three days. <coughs> We're fighting in orange groves, we're fighting in grape orchards, and this is like, if you've ever fought in those things, they're very high berms, and they're very difficult to uh, fight through and fight over. Um, it's similar to hedgerows, but they're not hedgerows, right, that we saw in World War II that we hear about. Uh, and these things were very, very difficult. And the way the enemy would fight was it would get you, um, they would, uh, they would try and roll you up inside the um, inside the grape orchards uh, in the uh, in the lanes between the between the mounds of dirt, right? Uh, and so this was very difficult. Uh, we had one guy shot. We had to medevac him out. Uh, we're constantly pushing the fight. Well, during this time, people are trading sides. So on the third night, um, we hear that there's going to be a large number of guys coming over. And I'm like, all right. The sun comes up. Lo and behold, we got nearly 1,500 people out there on our side. One of them comes up and says, uh, uh, the guy that I nicknamed Elvis, uh, he was a hard worker, and he would go out and get everything done for us. But the reason I called him Elvis was he, he only knew one phrase in English, and that was, thank you very much. <laughs> and, and, and I don't know who taught him that, but it was precious. And so I'd say, go get Elvis. And he started calling himself Elvis. <laughs> and so, you know, it was great. So he would come up, and I would say, where's Elvis? And Elvis would come in, and, and you know, uh, we'd get some interpretation going, and Elvis would go out. And, and get stuff done. And, and everything I said to him, it was, thank you very much, thank you very much, thank you very much. <laughs> it didn't matter what it was. Right? So, <clears throat> yeah, he was a great guy. But anyways, uh, so, uh, you know, Elvis comes up to me, and, you know, I look at him, and I go, wow, where did all these people come from? And I go, thank you very much, because he doesn't know what I'm saying. <laughs> and uh, uh, I go to my battalion commander, and I go, hey, sir, we got a guy, we got all these guys out here. And he was like, oh, my. Right, and we had had uh, you know weapons dropped in and other stuff. So we started issuing out weapons, started training them on the stuff, getting them getting them ready to go because we want to do that final push. Uh, and we had a low in the uh, you know, small arms fighting, right? And we had a lot of intel that came over, and so we put together when we sat with Armored Karzai and we put together a uh, a uh, close air support. Um, campaign where these guys were telling us the bad guys were and the village elders were verifying that. And we didn't drop one bomb unless Harmon Karzai and the village elders said drop the bomb, right? And so we got we got Harmon Karzai um, and the village elders. We taught them one word. You want us to do it, you have to say smoke them. And so it was hilarious because the uh, village elders, that's the only word they knew in English, most of them, and it was like, smoke them, smoke them, you know? And uh, they a big band of guys, so we would send out the ISR to look at it, and there's a bunch of guys there, uh, and they were just amazed at being able to watch this, right? Uh, same thing with um, night vision goggles, right? The way I used to keep uh, the Afghan sentries awake was, I let them use my, uh, my night vision goggles. The first time I did that, I go, here. And I hand him the goggles, and I put them up to your eyes. He puts up the X, and he's like, <laughs> you know, and then he puts it up. And then you couldn't get him away from it. it was like a, it's like my grandson with a toy, right? Uh, it, you couldn't get it out of his hands. Uh, but it kept him awake, and it kept him vigilant, right? Uh, and so that was one of the ways that, you know, we partnered an American with him and, you know, made sure that they were, they were doing the right thing. So you have these 1,500 come over, and then December 5th, right? it's heartbreaking. What happens? Heartbreaking. So we get this intel, and we put together the bombing campaign, and Karzai gives us the uh, okay to do it. And we got, you know, F-15s and 18s and B-52s just loitering off, coming in, and we're slamming ordnance in. Broad daylight, right? And uh, in the midst of all this, we got mail for the first time, right? 
So a couple months there on the ground, mail comes in, uh, and so we distribute the mail, and uh, the guys are opening it up, and you know they got uh, Oreos and Twinkies and you know, all the things that they like, you know, notes and letters from their uh, from their wives and loved ones, and pictures of the kids and all this, stuff. and so it was great. Morale was high, people were happy. Well. Uh, the tragedy struck when, uh, unfortunately, there was an error in the procedures um, to direct uh, bombs on target. And the error was the changing of the batteries in the, uh, the um, laser system that we were using uh, to provide the grid coordinates for the enemy positions. Once you change the batteries in this particular system, um, the uh, grid coordinate defaults to center mass of your location. And the um, individual responsible for that did not double check. And the grid coordinate that he sent up to the B-52 with a 2,000 pound bomb on it uh, was our center mass of our location. And that bomb hit. And we had casualties from center mass uh, all the way out to about 200 meters. And there was no particular pattern in who got hit and who got hurt. But do you hear this massive two-ton bomb, 2,000-pound bomb, coming towards you? I didn't and, hear a thing. And what happened to you and what happened to people next to you? What do you see? This well, uh, let me tell you. Um, it hit the top of our position. So we were occupying high ground in an old Soviet uh, artillery position in, in Shawali Kha. High ground, command of the, the uh, uh, great fields, the uh, Appalachian Great Command position from my battalion commander to look and make decisions, see what the heck's going on, that kind of stuff. So it was a great location. Uh, and it was already dug out, right? It was a former Soviet artillery position. So we were up there and we had our Afghan partners with us. Uh, you know, we shared a hole with them. And um, uh, what I remember. Um, is I didn't hear anything, but when I got up, I wasn't in the same place I was uh, that I remembered being in. And I had blood and uh, pieces of flesh and stuff all over my uniform. And unfortunately, I looked off to my side and saw a very tragic, um, a very tragic scene of you know an American uh, service member that was uh, severely injured. Uh, and I won't go uh, into the gory details of that, but suffice it to say that uh, he was uh, one of the three that was killed. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, from there, um, my uh, training had to kick in. Now, I was, I was hurt. I was limping around. I knew I had my ears were ringing. I was disoriented. Um, uh, I knew my hips were injured, uh, but I didn't know to what extent, and I knew I was uh, limping. But now it was a matter of regaining security, number one. And all of our ammunition <coughs> was up on top of the mountain. And so what started happening was the RPG started going off. The rounds started cooking off. Um, the grenades started exploding. And so we had to get people off that mountain quick and, um, and secure that area. And we did that. So we had a casualty control point. Then I had to make sure Harmon Karzai wasn't hurt, which he wasn't. Uh, and then we had to figure out where we were going to bring helicopters in. Our radios were all blown up, so I had my combo guy running around trying to put, he was injured too, everyone was injured, but he's trying to put together a radio that we could use to call back. So he finally did that, so we called back, we report what happened, and um, you know we got three, three uh, dead Americans that we know of, we got other Americans missing arms and legs, we got a number of our Afghan brothers, uh, you know, either killed or severely injured. Uh, and uh, I told our higher headquarters that we're going to back these guys out because they're our partners. And there was some pushback at higher levels on that. I don't know why. Uh, but we worked through that real carefully. Uh, and so at this time at Camp Rhino, uh, who was out at Camp Rhino was, um, was uh, General Mattis. You know, he's a one star at the time. And uh, uh, he was out at uh, Rhino with his guys, and so he was respond. He he made sure that the helicopters coming in and the C-130s that landed there at Rhino 
to transload our guys was all was all managed. 